Okay, welcome everybody. <coughs> it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, today's uh, colloquium speaker, Professor Grover Schwarzländer. Uh, <coughs> Grover is professor at the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, and I just learned a couple of hours ago that at least one faculty member here at Optical Science is a uh, graduate ac actually from RIT. RIT. Uh, <coughs> so Grover has pioneered um, optical radiation pressure for over 20 years, including optical force and torque from optical vortices, cambered refractive surfaces, gravitational assist, analogs in optics, um, and most recently light sails comprised of diffractive uh, optical elements, including a passive optical beam rider. Uh, primary, pri primarily an experimentalist, he is best known for optical tweezers and optical vortex solitons. Actually, I'm familiar with his vortex papers and tweezers papers, and optical vortex chron coronagraph measurement. Uh, Grover is a fellow of the Optical Society of America, a three times NASA NIAC fellow, um, and many of us. Uh, Many of us here probably know that uh, he is, or he was until recently, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the Optical Society of America B, of Joseph B. Uh, so if you ever had problems with your topical editor, it probably went to Grover <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, uh, today um, Grover will not talk about um, the stuff that I'm familiar with uh, in terms of his work, but things which I uh, said before, I think are really far out, literally far out things, and you can later see, well, how far out I really mean by that. Okay, welcome, Grover. Yeah. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, it's great to be back in, in Tucson. Uh, I left here maybe about 11 years ago, and uh, Things haven't changed too much. A lot of familiar faces, a lot of friendly faces. Good to see. It's good to see some students in here. Uh, uh, I remember when I was a, a graduate student, I uh, went to some talks, and I encourage you to go to as many talks as you can. You never know who you're going to, who you're going to uh, see. Uh, one of the uh, folks who changed my life basically uh, gave a talk at a seminar, and I ran. I was just a first-year graduate student. I ran to find out who invited him to, on campus because I wanted to do something similar. Um, uh, that guy who spoke was uh, Art Ashkin, and as you might know, Art got the Nobel Prize in Physics last year for optical tweezers. Uh, since then, I've been interested in, in radiation pressure and a number of other topics. Um, so anyhow, so I've, I'm kind of moving in scale from microscopic, tweezing microscopic uh, particles to actually moving very large things in space. And what motivates this is uh, basically a realization by most of the space community now that, that rockets are so old school and that rockets are very limiting and that in order to, to do things in space and go places we want to go, we have to think be, be beyond the rocket equation. And one mechanism for that is these low propulsion, low, low, low force, low thrust propulsion things that, such, as, uh, such as solar sails. Uh, some of you might know there's also a push by NASA, by uh, the Breakthrough Starshot program to do laser-assisted sailing as well. And so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the stuff that may be applicable for, uh, for those laser sails as well today. Uh, so yeah, I'm at RIT. Uh, this work I'll be talking is a, is a phase two NIAC, uh, NIAC uh, uh, project. NIAC is, stands for NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program. Uh, it was mandated by the National Academy of Sciences that NASA look at uh, and fund uh, projects that are looking 10 to 20, 30 years out uh, so they can prepare for the next generation uh, kind of space missions. And so that's what we get funding for. Um, and so my uh, co-workers on this are Les Johnson at the Marshall Space Flight Center. He is kind of the solar cell guy at NASA. Uh, Nelson Tiberian, some of you may know, he makes uh, advanced uh, photo... Uh, uh, liquid crystal uh, polarization diffraction gratings and, and uh, holographic phase plates. And uh, he's, uh, uh, he's been very successful in pushing these uh, from the laboratory out into various sectors of the economy. And uh, Margaret uh, uh, Kim, who is uh, just uh, coming on board with us, uh, uh, is working on um, developing some metamaterials concepts for making uh, advanced solar sails. All right, so yes, I'm at RIT. Uh, talk, I'll say a few words about RIT, uh, then talk about some shiny things, uh, talk about some scholarship uh, uh, background information, some of our measurements and models, and things about the future. So this is my uh, 
my uh, view from my, out, my window at night uh, outside my office at RIT. This is the Magic Center. The Magic is a new uh, film and animation center at RIT that's bringing in folks from New York and Hollywood and stuff to make, uh, it's a very nice space for film and animation. This shows a, a depiction of what a solar cell would look like if it's flying over, overhead at night. Now, I don't know if, if any of you have you've seen um, uh, the iridium flares. Is anybody familiar with iridium flares? They're, of course, uh, yeah, have I heard they're all gone now? I don't get any updates for them anymore. Yeah, it's, it's very sad. They were, well, I guess it depends on uh, where, if you're an astronomer, maybe you're glad to see them gone. But um, there are brilliant satellites that would fly over at night. When they, when they hit the sun just right, they would beam down about a five-mile diameter of, 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 of sunlight and just light things up, and it was just spectacular to see. Well, I'm hoping that maybe someday we can put some solar cells overhead that are diffractive in nature. We'll get uh, even a brilliant, more brilliant show. It might look something like this, but this is, this is just projecting into the future. So uh, you, might, uh, you might know that the Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science was named after Chester F. Carlson. Now, uh, do any of the students know who he was, what he invented? Uh, he, he was the father of xerography. So all the Xerox machines we have now, uh, basically, uh, probably one of the best things people can tell you, when you in your early career is that, that nobody wants this, this will never work. I think he got the same advice. And as we know, Xerox machines are useless, and nobody wants them, right? OK, so just you know, the kind of advice, you, negative advice we get sometimes should be very encouraging. So don't always take it personally. Uh, so anyhow, uh, so um, uh, that's Chester F. Carlson. We have a building dedicated to imaging science, RIT. It was formed in the 1980s. Uh, it was combined with the College of, of Imaging, Arts, and Science and bifurcated. Some of you actually might know Chris Dainty. Uh, Chris Dainty is a well-known uh, uh, optics, optical scientist in, uh, well, in Ireland, I guess, but now I think he might be at University College London. And uh, he actually uh, applied to RIT because this program was, was very, it still is very, very good for uh, the imaging arts and sciences. And so folks come because they love cameras, they love imaging, and most of our faculty are involved in things like remote sensing and uh, uh, taking pictures with satellites and analyzing those pictures. We have a BS, uh, MS, and PhD degree. Most of the students are in the PhD uh, program at RIT. It's hard to recruit undergraduate students in a niche area like, like imaging science. Uh, I thought we had 19, but maybe we have 17 core faculty with primary appointments in imaging science. I guess it depends on how you count. And uh, we have a number of students and a number of programs. And uh, one of the things that I want to point out to you is the pedagogy that they, they use that they've been using for years is it's called the imaging change. So uh, I know uh, you should teach here. We hear you basically in quantum photonics. Uh, and uh, in imaging uh, at RIT, we, we basically go through this whole imaging chain from the source, the objects, how you collect them, how you analyze the data. And so this is what allows our students to get good jobs at various different uh, communities. I'm sure you're all going to get good jobs too because optics is very enabling. And so uh, you're very smart to go into this field. And, uh, and I think almost any path you take, you'll be able to find a successful, successful career. OK, so now a few things about shiny things. Um, uh, does anybody know what these are? Oh, cross this out here. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, th these are images of, of, of a black hole, right? Fantastic. I mean, this is like just amazing, state of the art. You can't imagine ever thinking that somebody can see a black hole. And yes, and yet, with lots of international collaboration, lots of uh, data processing, imaging processing, they got these pictures. It looks just fantastic. What, what a triumph for science. Uh, and what is this? Uh, well, this is not actually an image, but we did pick up the signature of this. This is a colliding black holes. We've, de de determined, we've uh, picked up the signature from, of, of colliding neutron stars. What amazing science, right? It's just amazing what folks can do these days, right? We're looking at the uh, far, far reaches of the galaxy, and uh, we're seeing just the most amazing things, okay? So it's really a great time for, for looking at things in space. What is this? It, it, it's the sun, okay? It's actually a bunch of, uh, well, I'll give you this, this in here. It's a bunch of stitched projections. You can kind of see the projections here, these stitching of, of the, uh, I guess this is probably the north pole of the sun in this case. So it's taken at a very low inclination angle. And basically, you're just like looking up at the sun at this angle. And if you go around the sun at this low inclination angle, you can kind of stitch together these pictures and kind of get some sense of what the sun might look like. This is the best picture of the sun we have. Now, we've, we've seen things like this and things like that, right? How come we don't have a good picture of the poles of the sun? It, obviously, there must be something interesting up there, right? 
you know, we really should get there someday. Uh, why haven't we done it? Is, it? is it more difficult than imaging a black hole? It must be, right? It must be. And what's, what's the problem? It's the problem is that we're orbiting the ecliptic of, of our solar system. And in order to go from this kind of orbit and crank yourself up to a higher orbit so you can go over the poles is tremendously expensive in terms of energy. Okay? Now, some folks have done it with, uh, with um, using gravitational assists off of Venus or Jupiter. Uh, you can, it takes time, and those are, are, are long missions. Uh, one of the things I'll describe today is that we can uh, get to a solar polar orbit within about five years using just radiation pressure with no gravitational assists. So this is one of the promises of, of solar sailing is that we may be able to actually do some heliophysics looking at something that's probably more important than black holes to us, and uh, uh, that is basically what's the nature of our sun. We would like to have a constellation of satellites at various different inclination angles around the sun so we can monitor it basically 24-7, so we can predict space weather, we can, we can uh, learn some heliophysics, and there's lots of open questions that NASA continuously is asking scientists to answer about the sun. So what makes the sun great? Well, the closer you get to the sun, the higher the irradiance. So this shows that the irradiance at, at one Earth orbit is about a, a kilowatt per square meter. As you get closer, you get even more irradiance, so you can get up to about nine kilowatts per square meter. So there's advantages for doing solar sailing the closer you get into uh, toward the sun. Okay? And it's actually not that hard to orbit with the solar cell toward the sun. Now you might imagine what happens. The sun is pushing me away this way. How can I go toward the sun if the, if the sunlight is pushing me away? And I'll, I'll describe that uh, a little bit later. Okay, so a little bit of history about radiation pressure. Actually, some of the earliest stuff goes back to Kepler uh, and then later Newton where they talked about the corpuscular theory of light. Uh, and, uh, and they basically realized that light probably has momentum. Another thing that intrigued me was that Kelvin uh, was uh, apparently the first person to describe the ponder motor force. This is what basically won Art Ashkin his Nobel Prize, is using uh, basically the, this ponder motor of a gradient force to do optical tweezers. So sometimes it takes hundreds of years for things to kind of get uh, from a realization of the fundamental uh, nature of science in order to, to, to turn it into technology. Now, we know many of us attribute Maxwell to actually first uh, basically uh, showing how uh, Maxwell's equations gave rise to radiation pressure and things like the ponder motor force. And then eventually people made measurements, Nichols and uh, Hulls, Lebedev pointing, uh, showed it earlier last century that, uh, that the, even though the force was weak, it did ex indeed exist. Now, in terms of solar sailing, it took the early 1900s for some uh, Russian uh, rocket scientists to start pondering about the uh, possibility of using, using radiation pressure to make solar sails. So it's now thinking about very large structures uh, in space. And then various different uh, space programs actually had to, had, had to take advantage of uh, radiation pressure. For example, in the Mariner 10, uh, mission, they lost their attitude control device or their momentum control device and they used radiation pressure to actually help stabilize the satellite. So it, it actually found uses uh, er, early on that were not, not intentional, but the, the uh, solar panels were big enough that they could, they could take advantage of the radiation pressure. Then in the 70s, it was realized that we could actually uh, have a unique opportunity to fly a solar cell past Halley's Comet. And this, this, uh, this, uh, these calculations were first done by uh, by uh, Jeremy Wright, and, uh, and later was advanced, of course, by people like Carl Sagan. If you watch some of the old uh, Johnny Carson uh, YouTube videos, you'll see Carl Sagan on talking about uh, the solar cells. So this has been a dream for, they, they, they started the, the Planetary Society, which you folks aware of the Planetary Society? Anybody? Yeah, you may be members. Um, they actually have a, a solar cell orbiting the Earth right now. And uh, it's uh, been successfully shown that the radiation pressure help, has helped to increase the, the apogee, basically, of the cell, as they had predicted. It's starting to fall down now because they're in a low, low enough Earth orbit that uh, drag is starting to overcome this, the satellite, and it'll probably fall down before too long. And there have been many contributors, um, including uh, some folks in, uh, uh, across the world. There's a great interest by the Japanese, particularly, I'll show you a picture of their, their solar cell they launched some years back, uh, uh, and uh, a whole list of international folks and, and businesses, including, of course, Breakthrough Starshot. 
So I would say that uh, it's not uh, necessarily science fiction anymore, that uh, even though some of the earliest ideas uh, for, for solar sailing came out of the science fiction community about uh, thinking of fantastic ways we can travel through space, um, uh, we are now making demonstration missions, uh, not we, I mean NASA, folks like that, uh, are, are, are making great advances to demonstrate technologies. This, so this is why we're basically akin to the, the time of the Wright brothers, okay, as I said in my abstract. Okay. We're, imagine, imagine the you know, 1920s, okay, and people are starting to explore how to get lift, how to, how to sustain flight, and the tremendous excitement that happened from the first few uh, tests, and how much, uh, how much people started to think about ways of turning the simple missions into things like tr transporting people, uh, uh, military uses, um, uh, you know, any number of types of airplanes and airplane designs. Uh, jet engines came much later, of course. But you can see the tremendous pet potential. And so if you're a visionary, you might think, you know, can something similar happen for solar sailing? All right, so what are some of the advantages of, of light sails over mass expelling rockets? Well, first, there's no heavy propellant to lift into space. So this is what basically limits rockets because you, you have to, a lot of the mass ends up being attributed to the, the, the propellant itself and that limits, if you need uh, more mass, you need a bigger rocket and you basically run out of a, a way of effectively uh, lifting uh, enough propellant to go to the places we really want to go. Uh, there's continuous acceleration from a light cell allowing very high delta Vs. And so this means that what's delta V? Delta V is basically how much velocity you need to change from let's say an Earth orbit to some other orbit so that you can get from point A to B. So let's say you want to go from Earth to Mars, you need so, much, so many kilometers per second changing your velocity in order to accomplish that mission. And so with the continuous acceleration from light sails, it might take time because the acceleration is, is small, but you have free energy basically from sunlight. Another advantage is non-Keplerian orbits. You can imagine if you want to put a satellite at, uh, above the North Pole of the Earth, what's going to happen? Going to fall down, right? It can't orbit. There's no orbit. It's just sitting there, right? There's nothing to keep it keep it up there, right? So people suggest, well, with radiation pressure, you may be able to have a big enough cell to counter counter the gravitational force of the Earth and have have a, what they call pole sitters. This could be useful for communication, for example, over the now north and south uh, hemisphere of the Earth. Um, radiation pressure is perhaps the only known method of reaching distant stars, except perhaps uh, antimatter propulsion. Uh, uh, and some would say nuclear propulsion. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, get out beyond our, the, the heliopause, get to distant stars uh, with, um, well, it's not going to happen with rockets for sure. So uh, people have made various estimations of all these different types of technologies, and, and, and radiation pressure seems to be the one thing that may allow us to become really kind of a, a star faring or space space-faring civilization. How do we get beyond our star and go to distant stars? So there's been these demonstration missions uh, by uh, uh, Japan. Uh, uh, I show here the kind of weights and the, mat and the uh, areas of the sails here to give you some uh, magnitude. 200 square meters, uh, 10 square meters for, a, uh, actually I think this was 10 by 10, should be 100 square meters for the nanocell D. Uh, the light cell two now is like 32 square uh, square meters, does that sound right? That sounds a little bit small. That might be right because it's a CubeSat. And uh, the NIA Scout uh, that uh, is, uh, is, uh, is proposed for launch is an 86 uh, square meter cell. I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later too. So they're getting up in size. The weight is basically coming down. In order to have efficient missions, you want low, low, low mass. Low mass means for a given amount of force, that means more acceleration. You get there faster, basically. Some of the future uh, hopes are you get kilometer square uh, areas. You get masses per unit area of about 0.1 grams. And so you can see we're, we're basically, well, if you do the you divide, we're, we're far from that right now. We might be hundreds of, of uh, hundreds of grams per square meter. But these are some of the targets that the solar selling community has. Okay, here's a picture of the Nanosal D. Uh, I think it was 10 by 10 meters. Um, was it three? Does that look like 10 meters? No, I guess that is probably 10 square meters. Okay. Uh, yeah, it must be like three meters by three meters. 
across roughly. Uh, and uh, and uh, what basically it, the, the objective NASA had was to basically just send the thing up, let it unfurl, and see what happens. So it was very early technology demonstration. The Japanese, uh, a little bit before even NASA, they successfully got their uh, Icarus, uh, they call it kite craft up. This is a, a picture of what it looks like. This is uh, a, a, a ion uh, engine here, which was the main propulsion of the system. It really wasn't made to be driven solely by solar sailing, but they wanted to demonstrate solar sails for this. These show some uh, solar arrays for collecting energy from the sun and, and, and driving the, the uh, ion engine. And uh, this was uh, 200 square meters. It was like the th thickness of, the, of this capton here, uh, which is a polyimid, was is about seven and a half microns thick. And, uh, and they achieved uh, radiation pressure forces of about a millinewton. I can think a millinewton. What's a millinewton? Right? What's a millinewton? It seems small, but what are you fighting against in space? You're fighting against only, if you're away from the Earth, you're only fighting the gravitational uh, for, uh, force of, of the sun, okay? which is actually not that strong. So a billion newton is enough to actually be able to do things with radiation pressure, even though it seems small. You wouldn't use this on Earth to, to move things around, um, but uh, in space, it's, it's, it's a respectable number. And here shows the uh, light sail one that the Planetary Society put up. It's all these three sails are based on the, the, the principle of, of reflection. Angle of incidence is equal to students. Angle of reflection, right? Okay. So what happens is the k vector of light coming in, okay, the momentum vector, if you like, of light comes in at, at this angle, comes off at this angle. The change in momentum is always in a direction that's uh, uh, perpendicular to the surface of the sail. So the force is always perpendicular to, to the sail. So what this means is if you want to steer your sail, okay, imagine you're, you're in, your, in the car. How do, you, how do you steer your car? Well, you steer your car, you only move the wheels, right? Imagine if you had a... Uh, move the whole car this way in order to go off in this direction, right? Okay, imagine your car had one big wheel, for example. Okay, does anybody ride a unicycle? It must be kind of similar to that. You do? I want to try it sometime. It must be difficult, okay? So if you have a very big, big sail, now you're trying to tilt it this way so I can have a force off in this direction, but now this thing is thin. It's going to be wobbly. You're going to have uh, oscillation modes. It's not the best way to think about steering the sail. So what I say it's cumbersome navigation, and, uh, and we do have to navigate in space, okay? It's not, it's not sufficient just to leave the sail in one orientation for the, for the entire mission. There's various reasons why, depending on where you want to go, you need to change it in different directions. So in order to get um, um, a, uh, 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 well, let me see, I probably, probably need to set this up a little bit better. Uh, why do you want to tilt your sail is because of, I'll, I'll go to this mission, for example, first. Let's say I want to go from Earth to Mars. Okay. I want to orient my sail. I want to force, my, my, uh, a force in a direction that is tangential to the direction of my orbit. Okay. So I spiral outwards. Okay. If I was always facing the sun, then what would happen is I would simply move away from the sun and I'd probably change, I might have an e e elliptical orbit, but it wouldn't get me to, the, to Mars in such a way that I can make a rendezvous, okay, an efficient rendezvous. Well, I might do a, fly, a fast flyby, but if I really want to get to Mars and drop something off, I need to be matching not only the distance from the sun of Mars at the right time, but also match the velocity. Okay? So in order to do this, we have these kind of spiral trajectories. Now, in order to get a force that is a component of force that's tangential to the sun, I cannot be facing the sun. I tilt my sail this way. Now, I told you the force is normal to the surface. Okay? So if I'm if I'm I have a have a have a, a force vector in this direction, it means I will start to spiral out in that direction, as well as be pushed away from the sun. But it turns out that push away from the sun is really not affecting the orbit as much as you, you might think. So as long as we have a tangential component of force, that's what we want. And that's what this these are the only equations I think I'll show here. Well, maybe it's a small lie, but uh, the net force on the sail is, is the gravitational force from the sun, okay, which you probably know from physics here, and the radiation pressure force, which I've just written in a fancy way that says it depends on the area of the sail, depends on the irradiance, and depends on the distance from the sun. And then there's this efficiency vector, eta. And so this eta basically can have two components. If you, for example, you might think there's a component away from the sun and away 
tangential to the orbit, okay, tangential to orbit and radially away from the, from the sun. And so what we want to do for a solar cell is we want to, okay, I'm just rewriting this equation on two components, one's radially away from the sun and one is azimuthal or along the direction of your orbit. We want to optimize this component here. And this component basically says it has some efficiency vector. It depends on some critical mass per unit area. This mass per unit area basically depends on some constants, uh, mass of the sun, g, the radius of the Earth's orbit, the radiance of the Earth's orbit. But it tends to be about one and a half grams per square meter. So that's a kind of a, a, a normalizing factor. And then it depends on the aerial density of my sail itself. So if my sail is very, let's say, low density, low aerial density, think low mass, this number is small, this ratio will be high. Great. This component will be good. I'll get a nice azimuthal component. I can spiral out toward Mars and get there uh, very efficiently. Uh, this number can also be negative. So this means that, that this negative sign could, be, could turn into a positive sign, which means that instead of spiraling out toward Mars, I could actually spiral in toward Venus or toward the Sun. Okay, so this is the way I, I, I suggested earlier, we have ways of actually getting toward the sun, even though you think the sunlight is pushing you away, as long as I have some component of force. Where the force direction is opposite the direction of my velocity vector of my orbit, I can spiral in toward the sun. Okay, so we can solve these equations basically like using Ruggakata. There's not very many closed form solutions uh, for a general, uh, uh, general sail. But basically, what we want to do is we want to optimize this, this parameter here. So it means we want to know how do we, how can we, for example, face the sun all the time but still get a component perpendicular to the, the sun line, okay? That would be ideal. It means I'm not losing any energy by the cosine of the angle theta, right? If I, if I go like this, you can't see me anymore, right? Okay, okay, if I go like this, you can see me, right? So it's the same kind of principle with the solar sail. The sail wants, this, wants to be flooded with as much sunlight as possible, with as much direct uh, irradiance, um, but yet I want to force in that direction. And so this is why I came up with this idea of a diffractive solar sail. Okay, I'll skip this. I'll just uh, show you what our jump to basically a small conclusion. If you're falling asleep, you can just cut, catch the main, main conclusion of what we're working toward is uh, a, a constellation of satellites, this shows this constellation of, of satellites orbiting the sun, we propose we can go from one Earth orbit, one AU, to about 0.3 in five years using a diffractive solar cell. We can raise the inclination above the ecliptic by 60 degrees, and this could be done with a 16 kilogram 6U CubeSat with a, a 20 by 20 meter square cell, for example. Okay. Now, and again, the idea is that we want to raise this inclination so we can look down toward the poles of the sun. And we can even go higher inclinations, just let the thing go longer. Uh, this was just kind of a, a sample experiment, a sample calculation that we did. So you might ask, gee, professor, um, why does a, a diffractive grating uh, have a force on it? Well, um, uh, we can go back to the history about Maxwell and Newton and de Broglie and various things, but the main idea is that you have light coming into a diffraction grating in one direction. Let's say it's a transmissive grating. It can come out in another direction. This change in the K vector means it's a change of momentum. Newton told us a change of momentum means we have a force. Okay, so the force in this case would be off in this direction. Uh, why does it change direction here? It was because we have a grading. Okay, this grading we know from Fourier series principles have a bunch of their own, we call them grading momentum orders. And so these grading momentum orders coupled to the light producing this change direction of, of, of the light coming through. And what's important here is the parameter of this, the grading period, capital lambda here. Okay. So let's see, what am I skipping here? Uh, again, basically the radiation pressure force can have a big effect in space. Okay, this shows that for example, if I have a one, one kilowatt per square meter, that's typically what you get at one AU. If I have a 100 square meter cell, I integrate for a month for a one kilogram uh, spacecraft, sees the speed of light, I put it all together, I get a delta V of one uh, kilometer per second. Which is, which is respectable, okay? Typical missions, you might want a little bit bigger cell, or integrate a little bit longer, you might want to go for a whole year, but you want delta Vs on the order of kilometers per second for many kinds of, of space missions that said to go, to go to Mars or go to Venus. Okay. Now I'm assuming we're above, away from the Earth now. If you have to, we're not gonna launch a solar cell from the Earth. 
I don't think anytime soon. I don't think you'd want to do that. Some people look at a microwave propulsion to actually be able to do that, but that's still far off. All right. Now, for those who really want to understand what's happening at the, at the diffraction gradient, we could go back to Maxwell's equations. And what it basically comes down to is why we have diffraction is because we satisfy the boundary condition. We want, remember, E tangential is continuous. Does this sound familiar to you, graduate students? Yeah, okay. So the, what happens at a grade, I'd say go do this exercise. It's quite beautiful and easy to do. Just satisfy E tangential at the boundary. And what you're going to see is that the, the parallel component, P is a parallel component along the, of the K vector along here. This has, has to be a phase matching condition. It actually has nothing to do with E as much as it has to do with the phase. Okay, so the, e, the phase at, at, at the incident uh, part of the gradient should be equal to the phase at the output uh, part of the gradient, assuming a infinitely thin gradient. So the, the, in order to match the phase, we end up saying that the K, the component of, of light incident parallel to this surface, must be equal to the light that's transmitted uh, at parallel to the surface, uh, as well as we have now this gradient vector k, which is also along this, this direction here. And so these couple together ends up giving you classic gradient equation that you probably have used in some of your, your classes. Now, one of the ideas is that how do you make an efficient diffraction gradient? We want all the light diffracted into one order. And there are various folks worldwide looking at doing this thing for various different applications. Uh, and so uh, we're working with one of those groups at, at Beamco. Uh, for making these polarization diffraction gradients to do this. So it's possible to get very high efficiency diffraction into, into a single order so we get as much force in the direction that we want. And so people can also apply metamaterials principles in order to figure out ways of making you know, sub-wavelength structures uh, along here to also control the, uh, the gradient. And so those are some of like the, the exciting research opportunities, I think, for solar satellites. How do you, do, how do you design effective diffractive cells. You want them to be thin, lightweight, space hardened, and uh, space hardened means they're going to be able to withstand gamma rays and protons and electrons, and if you're in low Earth orbit, some of the atmosphere, oxygen, and things like that. So there's a lot of challenges for making these high efficiency gradients, and that's, that's why this is a, a cool research project. All right, so uh, of course it also turns out that sunlight is not monochromatic. Who would have guessed, okay? Uh, so uh, different uh, colors diffract at different angles, so you need to optimize your cell also for these different, different uh, uh, diffractive angles. And uh, we've calculated some of that, and basically we can show that, uh, for example, here's the uh, black body curve for the sun. We're interested in two, two components of force, a radial component of force that's away from the sun. We really don't want that, uh, but we don't, we don't mind some of that. That's this red curve here. This is zero. Okay, along, along this axis, here's the red and blue dots here. So, so uh, if we integrate this al ar along, the, uh, along the spectrum, we get, well, I don't remember what size cell this is. Uh, well, you can integrate this to get some value for the radiation force away from the sun. But then you look for the transverse component for it. It's much stronger. And so we can get a, a significant uh, band of the sunlight, like 83% of the, of, the, of the band of the sun, uh, diffracted, and then what happens at this point? We get a cutoff because it's a grading. Uh, the diffraction angle is 90 degrees at this point here, and uh, uh, we may be able to even couple some of that light into the grading, and that's one of the things we're working on is what happens at this cutoff uh, frequency. There's a lot of exciting things that might actually e even happen beyond the cutoff wavelength. Well, anyhow, so that's some of the background material. I want to talk about our measurements. Now, some of you folks may know this guy. You know, Pete, Pete Jansen, okay. Pete, Pete and I date back when I was here in Tucson, and uh, we keep in contact. And it turned out that we were doing some, uh, we were interested in measuring radiation pressure on diffraction gratings. And we were having trouble with our, our laboratory. Um, we have a very sensitive torsion oscillator. It's shown here. It's basically a vacuum torsion oscillator. We have a, you go to Lowe's and you buy a piece of screen, an aluminum screen, and that's your Faraday cage. And you buy a piece of, uh, you can't even see it here. It's like 25 micron thin tungsten filament. You hang and you, you put a copper, copper uh, torsion arm on this and you hang your diffraction gradient on one side and you put a balancing mass on the other side. And so this is very sensitive. This is like you know, sub-nanonewton sub, sub force sensitivity. And so my student, Lucy here, uh, she's not very big, but whenever she walked in the, into the lab, but just opened the door, the whole thing would start to oscillate. Okay. 
And so we thought, oh, okay, uh, our lab is in the basement, so maybe there's a better place than the basement. So there's a place that was built on bedrock. Okay, bedrock is you know, the gold standard, basically, for optics labs. Okay, it's supposed to be built right on the rock, and how can you do any better? And so put it in there, the thing still started to move around. Okay. So I talked to an architect, and the architect, she told me that, well, your, your floor is probably built on I-beams. Okay. And I-beams are made to sag. And so her little bit of mass was enough to cause the floor to sag, to cause our oscillator, oscillator to start to move around. And that was no good for experiments. So I said, hey, Pete, uh, your son's interested. He was a high school student then, is interested in radiation pressure. Can we come down to your, your home in Delaware? So we packed up the, the car. We drove down to Delaware, and we put it on his basement floor. Now, what's a basement? Anybody ever pour a basement floor? You pour it right on the ground, okay? So you can't do much better than that, okay? There's no I-beams, nothing. It's just basically a nice flat floor right on the ground and uh, in a suburb, so not a lot of traffic around, no trains, anything like that. And so the thing was rock solid. It was very good. So we were able to do the experiment uh, in Pete's basement. And we published this in PhysRev Letters, okay? Not bad for a high school student, okay? And so uh, what we've done now is we found a place on our campus, so we can't drive down to Delaware uh, every night and do our experiments, that uh, is basically a microfabrication facility that, uh, that, that uh, was built to try to be very stable so that uh, when people are making you know, submicron structures, their optics is not os moving all over the place and causing loss of resolution. So we're doing this experiment now uh, at RIT. Uh, and this is a very interesting experiment I wanted to describe. This is on our, our, what's called a bigrading. So this is a, basically a type of beam rider. Now imagine I have this laser beam and I, I shine it on a, um, a solar sail, okay? And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, the beam is it's a finite size. And what happens if, if, the, if this, uh, this solar sail starts to tip? Okay, what's gonna happen? The thing could kind of walk off the beam, right? Okay. Or if it just starts to slide, move sideways, there's no reason for it to be pulled back into the beam. Okay, this is not like optical tweezers that Art Ashkin did. This is, uh, we don't have the effect of this ponder motor force to pull the thing back into the beam. So how do you, how do you just take a, a, a nice Gaussian laser beam, for example, and make this thing stay inside the beam? Make your cell stay inside the beam? Well, what we designed was called a bi-grading. And so one half of the grading diffracts the light uh, uh, toward the axis of this bigrading. The other side would diffract, the, if, the, if, if the beam went through the top, it would diffract it downward. And this causes a restoring force on our grating. And this is basically shows, again, the experiment. We basically have a small tracking laser, helium neon laser, that re reflects light from a small mirror. And we can measure the displacement of the beam as this thing oscillates back and forth. And this shows uh, just basically two sets of experiments that we did. I won't go too much into detail about that. Uh, yeah, I could talk about that later if we need to. So one type of experiment we did for, uh, actually we did this with, uh, with, with uh, Eric Jansen, his son, Pete's son, is we basically just turned the laser on, uh, diffraction graded, and we, we asked what happens. And so what you, what you get is a step function response. Okay? Imagine you, uh, um, you know, you take a cup of, of water, basically, right? Okay, so it's here, right? And now I'm just start pushing it, okay? You get a step function response, no force, okay? Now suddenly I have a force on it, okay? What's the, what's the response of the system? And so if, uh, the classic uh, physics will tell you basically the thing will start oscillating about some uh, point here, and we can measure those oscillations, fit them to the closed form solutions, and from that we can back out the force on our system. And in this case, we got a force of about 0.4 nanonewtons. And that basically was like one of these types of experiments here. The laser, the diode laser coming in at some angle on this grating, and, uh, and it caused the, the, this, uh, this uh, force. In this case, this experiment was set up so the force was parallel to the grating. Remember, I told you there's two components of force we're interested in, the parallel and the normal component of force. So this one measured the parallel component of force. Later, we set the experiment up so we measured the normal component of force. And they both agreed with our theory. So. Uh, it all looked pretty good, okay. Well, getting back to the, uh, the bi-grading, what we're interested in, in general, is having not just a, a standard diffraction grading like the kind you might buy from Edmund Scientific, okay. We're interested in one that we have basically, it's called a space variant grading, where there's different patches. Each one of these may be in, individually addressable with electro-optic control. 
So you might imagine we have transparent conductors across them, some liquid crystal between them, and we can turn them on and off, steering the beam individually for each, each region of the cell so that now we have full navigational control of the cell. That's one of the things we, we we're working toward, and the first approximation of that is this bi-grading. So the bi-grading looks like this. We have one, the top part of the diffraction grading will if you have a beam light coming in, will diffract the light toward the axis of the, cell, of the cell here. The cell is this gray thing here. If the light comes down to the bottom part, it diffracts up this way here. And we're also assuming that this thing, if it's in space, it has a payload and it has some boom here. And so this would take all the optical mechanics of the system into account. Uh, this is much easier to describe in two dimensions than three dimensions. The two-dimensional model we've, we've already published in physics and optics uh, letters and the three-dimensional model we will be publishing soon. Uh, and so we wanted to understand what makes this thing stable, so it ends up being stable if this boom is, is large enough, and, uh, and if the, uh, you know, the, the, the moment of inertia of the cell uh, is within a certain range for the kind of forces and, and uh, torques we have on this cell. So the experiment, of course, nothing Nothing's real until you do the experiment, right? So we, we uh, worked with uh, Beamco. Uh, they make these, they call them cycloidal diffraction gratings. They're basically like polarization uh, holograms. They're made with liquid crystal that is uh, oriented cy cycloidally, okay, hence the name cycloidal, in this direction. So for this left panel here, uh, it cycles in one direction. On the other panel, it cycles the other direction. So because of that, it ends up diffracting light in, in equal opposite directions. Uh, the wavelengths of light that we use is uh, 800 nanometers. The grading period for this system should be like this, would be six microns. <clears throat> and the diffraction angle is only about, uh, about eight degrees. Okay, so we didn't need a lot of deviation of the light, diffracted angle of the light to demonstrate this effect. This shows a Microscopic images show that this gradient is very regular, and this is what it looks like in the laboratory. It basically, just kind of looks like look like a diffusive screen. You can't tell the left or right panel very easily uh, by just looking at it. Okay, it was a one inch by one inch sample mounted on our our torsion oscillator, uh, and so the moment arm basically goes off into this direction here. So we hit it with light, and we want to see what happens. All right, so this again shows uh, this restoring, uh, this nature of it when the light is on top versus when the light's on the bottom. <clears throat> this shows uh, our predicted uh, force. So if we're right at the equilibrium position, if we're right in the center, the light is hitting right in the center here, we're gonna be at this equilibrium point here. If we move a little bit one way, then there's a, uh, the negative slope means there's a restoring force pushing it backwards. Okay, so if X, we move X positive, the force is negative, so it moves back. Okay, if it goes up here, okay, if X is, becomes uh, on the left-hand side of the equilibrium position, the force is positive, it moves back this way. And so we have this slope here. There's this very nice Hooke's law dependence here, and uh, and even if it moves far away, there's still a, a constant force here. So we can model this as like a hyperbolic tangent function uh, in our in our model, if you like. This shows the actual beam profile. Okay, it's not that great of a beam, so the beam profile was not that important. And, uh, and what we found is that this, uh, this Hooke's Law restoring force scales basically as um, some parameter we call F0. F0 here was about 0.4 nanonewtons, basically what we can achieve with solar radiance. And uh, the size of the beam was uh, on the grading was two millimeters. And so this gives a Hooke's Law restoring force of like 10 to the minus seven newtons per meter. So we have to combine this restoring force with a natural restoring uh, uh, force or the, uh, the torsional stiffness of our pendulum. And so what we saw is that in fact, we did get a, a restoring force um, uh, acted on the, on the cell uh, as we expected. Not only that, we decided, well, let's take it one step further. Let's say if this thing is, if this cell is oscillating back and forth, so it's basically, it's just moving back and forth like this. The period uh, is, uh, is, uh, is like 100 seconds, okay? So these are long experiments, so students are patient, right? Okay. Um, and, uh, and so we could turn the laser basically uh, on and off in synchron synchronicity with the phase of this oscillation. And so by doing that, we could demonstrate what's called parametric cooling. 
So basically the laser what it was on when uh, the displacement times the velocity was positive and we turned the laser off when the displacement times the velocity was negative. And this allowed us to basically demonstrate this parametric cooling effect. And uh, I presented this last week at the, uh, uh, what's called Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop Symposium. And uh, some of the folks at Starshot were very thrilled because one of the problems with having a laser driven cell, for example, in space, is that first, how do you get it to ride the beam? We've demonstrated we can ride the beam. We also demonstrated that if this thing is oscillating, if you, if you can modulate the laser uh, if, with the right phase, you can actually stop the thing from oscillating. So many people see this kind of parametric cooling and other effects in like laser cavities with uh, optimal mechanical systems. Um, I think uh, a lot of work done with uh, basically stabilizing uh, all kinds of oscillators. It could even be just like an inverted pendulum. People try to demonstrate these effects. So it's not too surprising, but we demonstrated it and it's potentially useful. So this, this bi-grading beam rider already allowed us to, to show that uh, without cooling, the damping, of the, uh, the damping rate of our oscillator is, kind of has a quite long time scale, whereas with the cooling, we could get it to cool off quite quickly. And uh, this work has actually been accepted in FizRev letters and it's gonna appear as an editor's feature uh, when it comes out. So you might see some noise about that. We also calculated what this uh, decay period uh, uh, per, per natural period of the, of, of the gradient is. And it turned out to be a very interesting uh, type of behavior. Basically it says that this k, uh, this is k is not the two pi over lambda k, I apologize for notation here. This is the stiffness of our oscillator, the natural stiffness of our torsion oscillator. And so what it shows is that basically as the radiation pressure stiffness, or basically is the force or the power of the laser gets stronger, this number increases. And so uh, your, the time it takes for it to cool it off can be quite fast. So this graph basically shows a plot of this function here. So if you want to cool it off very fast, you just apply more, more force and get the thing to, to damp out uh, to whatever, whatever number you're satisfied with, I suppose. There must be limits, but let's not talk about that. All right, so now uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, our three-dimensional model. So instead of having a bi-grading, what we propose to do is have uh, uh, a, uh, a diffractive structure where the k-vector, these diffractive k-vectors, if you like, uh, the, the grading period, if you like, all points uh, inward here. Okay? Now, what this basically is is, is a hologram of an uh, axicon. Okay, so nothing too complicated about this. If you look at, anybody use CDs anymore? Okay, yeah. It basically will look kind of like a CD, okay? Imagine you just take your, take the, you very carefully peel off the top upper layer of your, of your compact disc, throw it into space above low Earth orbit, if, if you can toss it up that, that high, and the thing will start to, start, start, start to sail. Now we want to put this in a laser beam, and so we did the full optimal mechanical control of this in, in three dimensions, and it's a bit, bit uh, busy, but what we showed is that what we expect is we get stable, these, these are called phase plots, this shows the, the displacement of the cell from the uh, equilibrium position, and this y-axis shows the velocity, so we show we get these stable orbits for either flat top beams or for Gaussian shaped beams, and there's two periods of oscillation typically, and for, I think, I don't remember what the, he must have looked at like maybe like a 10, 10 kilowatt laser beam in this case. So the periods are, are quite long. The frequencies are extremely small. So this frequency will scale up with the laser power. So if you go to 100 gigawatts, it's going to be uh, shorter frequencies, of course. Okay. All right, so a little bit about the future, our upcoming work. Uh, you know, we're very serious about eventually putting a diffractive uh, structure in space to test it. Before we do that, we have to do space weathering tests. So we're doing this at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. We've also done some space testing already at Goddard as well. Uh, we're working on, and we're opening up to the community, anybody interested in, in working on metamaterials for this, this, uh, this uh, application, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Uh, we want to, we will soon be measuring electro-optically controlled diffraction gratings. Uh, basically, Beamco is uh, making those, and they already are demonstrating beam steering for other customers, so, uh, this should not take, take uh, no, nothing new needs to be developed to do these, these experiments. Uh, we're doing, uh, developing ideas for testing uh, two-dimensional uh, forces 
And uh, uh, instead of just using the, the torsion oscillator, which really only measures one degree of, of freedom, we're trying to develop experiments. We're doing two degrees of freedom now. And uh, we have a, a CubeSat mission we're actually working on to, uh, uh, for low Earth orbit, just to test the deployment, the unfurlment, and radiation pressure with a, a, a team of students at RIT. And then Marshall will be doing a, a serious uh, feasibility study for our solar polar orbiter mission. Uh, so some of the open questions we have is really comparing diffractives with reflectives. There's a lot of caveats for, for both types of systems about reflectivities and mass advantages and control and risk and unfurlment and lots of things. So uh, we're going to be uh, taking a look at the differences between these systems over the next few years. Um, I already talked about the solar efficiencies across the solar spectrum, space environment. Deploying is a, always an issue. Uh, what's the best origami to use to get this thing off packaged up into a small CubeSat and then get it to unfurl without ripping or changing your optics? And uh, one of the most interesting things, uh, I think, is this electro-optic control scheme. Because right now, what people use in, in satellites, they use uh, like reaction wheels for controlling momentum. And one of the first things that you hear about going, going wrong with you know, uh, James Webb, James Webb's not up yet. The first thing that will go wrong with James Webb, um, but the, that will go wrong with you know, Hubble and all these other telescopes, is their, their pointing stability, right? They need to be able to point this thing very stably. And, uh, and it relies on mechanical systems, these reaction wheels. And, um, and so it's possible that we could use these electro-optic control schemes using diffraction gratings to offset some of that risk of, of failure with instead of using mechanical systems, we all know we love optics. If you can do optics instead of mechanics, all the better, right? So uh, uh, we're very excited about that. NASA's very excited about that. This shows the CubeSat team. This is my student, Erin. She's an MS, PhD stu MS BS student in uh, mechanical engineering. And they are working on uh, developing a, a mission uh, study to uh, unfurl a sail in space. So this shows one of their uh, sails that they they uh, unfurled last year. <clears throat> this is just basically space blankets with, uh, with um, um, what do you call these things? Measure tape measures. Okay, and so they had the, they have a, they have a, 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 a I think a two U CubeSat, maybe three U, two U I guess uh, to to do these experiments. So we're building up toward uh, uh, demonstrating that in the lab, and then hopefully get it into space. This shows my team of, of PhD of PhD other students. This is uh, uh, Pratik uh, Srivastava, who's uh, doing our modeling. This is Lucy, who I showed you earlier, who's doing uh, the experiments in the lab. And this shows uh, Amber and I with Les Johnson, our, our NIAC partner, uh, at the unfurlment of the NIA Scout. Okay, so this was basically what's, what I love about this this picture is you see these balloons. Okay, these balloons were not there because it was party time. Okay, the balloons are there because to try to demonstrate something in low gravity, okay, an unfurlment of a system in low, low gravity, especially this thing is like, like two and a half microns thick, right? How do, you, how do you mitigate the effects of gravity? Oh, let's go get some helium balloons, okay? And so that's what they use to help offset the, the, the weight uh, load uh, at the tips of, of these, uh, these sails, okay? So anyhow, so we're integrated in with this, these teams. We're uh, very uh, excited about... Uh, you know, the future prospects for solar sailing in space and eventually uh, laser uh, sailing as well. And so I acknowledge uh, uh, students again, Les Johnson and Andy Heaton at NASA Marshall, uh, Nelson Spirit at Beamco, uh, Eric Johnson, uh, who we call the, uh, uh, the uh, researcher at the, at the Pete Lee Hong Jansen Lab in Wilmington, Delaware. We did those first experiments. And the SIDORs at, at SIDOR Optics who helped us uh, uh, basically, we bought a diffraction grating from original the experiment was, it was a diffraction grating from uh, some telecom company, and these are thick gratings. Okay, so these folks helped us uh, thin down the grating to about 200 microns thick, so that we could, without damaging the grating, so we can do the experiments. Okay, so I just want to end with this uh, statement here that um, basically we were interested in metamaterials, photonics principles in space, and I think many of you are doing materials in one aspect or photonics in another aspect, there's great opportunities in space for moving things, uh, uh, moving some of the functionality you get uh, with these systems. One of them involves solar cells, but there's many others. And I say combined, these principles offer, afford a wide degree of control, allowing optimized light cells that are uniquely designed for a particular mission. Now, what does this mean? This means that if, if, 
if you if you're a jet if if if, if you know you don't design a fighter jet with a bi uh, plane great airplane right you know, a bi wing great bi wing plane right each uh, you don't you don't uh, you know you don't drive your Ferrari uh, around just to go to the grocery store right okay. You know, so each mission does have, requires its own type of optimized uh, structure. And so we think that you know, the, the wide um, amount of parameter space we have in optics and photonics allows us to think about how to optimize each one of these missions beyond just a simple reflective cell. Right? Reflective cells uh, are kind of the first order approximation to what you really want to do. OK, so these are some uh, recent publications. You folks can, uh, students can all read these and, and send me your questions later. Okay, maybe you've read them already, I don't know. Okay, thank you for your attention.